great marriage supper of God for the believers and the unbelievers for the great marriage supper of God and the, the Lamb, of course, is for believers that marriage supper. So we mentioned that. Now Jesus is coming back in Revelation nineteen eleven, uh, in, in the first verse there, and I saw heaven opened, uh, anor, anorgo, a n o i g o, and, and really I just use that because what what that word open means there is um, heaven's open and it's open permanently. Uh, it's not an open and closed door as we saw earlier in the book of Revelation, but this is open in heaven. It's a permanent opening. Um, uh, in the Greek, uh, they call it a perfect tense. That's why it's, heaven's always open. Christ is coming back. He's coming back forever and ever. When he comes back here that we're talking about, this is his second coming. His second uh, standing on the Mount of Olives. Uh, he's coming back and he's going to be here permanently. Because he sets up his millennial period, and of course that goes right into uh, eternity. Uh, Jesus said, "I am going away, and I will come back again." Now he said, when he comes back, he is going to stand on the Mount of Olives, and we see that in um, if you read from uh, Israel, where Israel is, we went to Israel several years ago. We stood on the Mount of Olives there, and that's where Jesus is coming back, where we'd be very close. So in Zechariah fourteen one through four, it says, "Behold, the day of the Lamb cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided into the midst of thee. For I will gather all the nations; God will gather all the nations. In other words, against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall battle of Armageddon, and shall be taken, and the houses uh, rifled or pillaged, and the women ravished, and let's see." And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, and when he fought, as when he fought in the, in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. In other words, split. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove towards the north, and half of the mountain towards the south. So Jesus is coming back, and he is going to come back, and he is going to stand on the Mount of Olives, as he said. And of course, you continue reading, and uh, they see him, and they cry for him whom they knew they pierced, which is talking about uh, the marks that Jesus held from the cross, which he's going to carry for eternity for that too. So... <clears throat> So, and when he went away, if you remember also, when Jesus went away and the disciples were looking at him as, as he ascended into heaven, uh, the angels, angels said, that, uh, why are you waiting here? The same Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the same Jesus who lived for 33 years on this earth, uh, you were nailed to the cross that went down into the grave. Uh, this same Jesus who rose the third day will come back, coming back. And a permanent result, coming back in the same way. And the clouds of heaven is going to come back. And when he comes back, he's going to rule forever and ever. <clears throat> so, verse 11 again. Go. Let me go back to Revelation here. Nineteen eleven, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called... Faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. <coughs> so at Christ's return, we see the image um, of a white horse. And those days, conquerors of, like the Roman Empire, uh, the Caesars, and all of those, they would have um, ridden a white horse. It showed victory. They were the conqueror of the war. So we have the white horse image down through here. And the conqueror of that white horse. And of course, in that time, they had a great victory. Now, the rider of the white horse is Jesus. Now, also, the rider of white, that white horse also uh, means that Genesis 3.15 was fulfilled. It's a fulfillment of that when we read in there, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And you've got it there, but he shall bruise thy head, which is talking about Satan, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So we see, actually, that, that's a fulfillment of it. 315 has been fulfilled at last. And we look at uh, it, the angels' conflict of, in heaven is over. The angels, the angelical war is over. And 
The demon angels are cast out. We win. Uh, there's no doubt of the outcome. God is going to win no matter what. That is the outcome. Christ is the conqueror. That There's no doubt about that. Uh, the blue skies open up and Christ comes back in the fulfillment of the Genesis 3.15 and also kind of in Genesis 12.1 through 3, which was kind of the marching orders for Abraham. And so we get a little bit of that too in, in chapter 12 in 1 through 3. <clears throat> now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of the country and from thy kindred and from the father's house unto the land that I shall show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. Now, this is a promise of that great nation because the millennial period is going to be set up and Israel is going to become a nation again during the tribulation time. So we see that in the land where I show thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. <coughs> and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and I will curse them that curse thee. <coughs> and the, all the nations of the families shall be blessed. So we see it. See, it's talking about his first coming. Uh in here and but this is talking about his second coming uh christ coming the second time uh and so this is a fulfillment of really kind of both of those passages uh that that we have there so again uh he is called in that chapter 19 back to revelation chapter 19 and verse 11 he's called he's called faithful and true <clears throat> now he was given this name and he will have this name forever uh, he has called those two great words again faithful and true uh, to you uh, he is faithful and true to us w when you do right uh, and faithful to you when you do wrong uh, he is always faithful he always comes come, is there for you um, it's like t today and, and, and having the uh, uh, Billy Graham uh celebration here they want to call it some crusades but he was here and we had people come down for rededication god did not leave them even in my own life as being saved as, as 12 years old some of my teenage years i kind of went back from god and i didn't get back to him until i was in my 20s god didn't leave me i i, I could tell when he was telling me i shouldn't be doing this and doing that but here we are but God never left me. He never leaves us, even when we're not doing what he wants us to do. Even when we're, we're sinning. He doesn't like our sin. Well, David, everybody knows David, King David. Uh, he loved God. God loved him. But he didn't love David's sin. Now, David got punished for that sin for many years. But God still loved David. He loved David as much then as when David wrote Psalms 23. And when he said in Psalms 51, when he confessed what he'd done before him, that he had sinned before God. God does not leave us. He's there. And he, lo he loved us just as much when we're sinning and when we're not sinning. And he's always there for us, waiting for us to come back. Like he was doing me and some of the people that came down uh, during this celebration. So what, what I'm saying is that the rider of the white horse was faithful and love David with a perfect love as he loved us. He is faithful to us when we are not even faithful to him. We need to remember that. So the rider of the white horse is called faithful. He's never changing. He doesn't change at all. He's truth. He's always true. Truth always. Uh, there's no fault in him. He's always truth. Uh, now, when God saved you, he did some things for you. Uh, he, he did many things. I'm just going to mention something. Um what he did, he, he puts you in um, all this. Let, let's just say you, you, you got a circle. He, he's, you're in the top, top circle. circle. Okay? So you have two circles. When God saved you, he put you in that top circle. In a relationship to him. And I mentioned what I did. John said you became the child of God. Uh, you had your sins forgiven. Uh, you're now uh, part of God's family. You're your children. That, that's what God did. He put you in that circle. And he put a seal around you. It says in Corinthians, we are sealed around you. He said uh, to the devil, you I take, take this warning. This person belongs to me. You cannot have this person. Now, we may, he may be able to trip us up and get us away from God, which he is very good about. And we follow. He can mess us up, but he can't have us forever. We're still saved. God is still with us. That seal is there. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Always. And God is indwelling. You see, when we become saved, God's Spirit, Christ's Spirit, comes and indwells us, lives in us. Um, 
<clears throat> and where our name is kept in the book of life, which becomes the Lamb's book of life. I was explaining the books earlier. Every, everybody's put in the book of life. And, at the, and, and ours, our name is not taken out. For those that don't believe their name is taken out of the book of life and put into another book of life, which becomes the book of works, which we get to in the White Throne Judgment later on. But our name is put in there and is put in there permanently because the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to us. And we keep that. Making, you know, you hear, um, it's, um, we hear people say, well, well, like me, like I was saved at 12, I said I made Lord, Jesus Lord of my life later on. We don't, we don't make him Lord. Jesus is Lord. It's really not, not, not to think Jesus is Lord. He's always Lord. <laughs> he's Lord of the unsaved too, just like he is the Lord of the saved. He's always saved. We, we really don't do. Now, there is a way we can um, make Jesus Lord when we hear things like that. We make him Lord. You can't make, make Lord. The minute you accept him, he was Lord and there's nothing you can do to make him Lord. He's always Lord. How does he become Lord? By studying and filling our minds with the Word of God. The more we know, the more doctrine, the more biblical truth we, we have, the more it flows through you, the more he takes over our life. And he becomes the Lord that he needs to be. That's how we make him Lord of our life, by studying his Word by listening to sermons, by growing. That's how he does. And he just he just keeps doing. And we just keep giving more and more of ourself over to him as he grows and matures us. Okay? That's what we do. Like in like in Sea of Child Evangelism Green for growth, for growing, we have. We grow each time we do that, and it helps us. So the rider of a white horse is faithful and he's true. He never changes. You can't change him. I can't change him. Nobody can change him. You see, this is very important. Listen, if you wake up in the morning, it's because God is faithful. Now, he's put a little thing in us and uses the air to make us breathe. There's a little thing in our brain that tells us we need to breathe. We need to wake up and our lungs and pressure and all this. But it's because he's faithful to you. There's no guarantee you, you could go to sleep tonight and not wake up tomorrow wake up in heaven if you're a Christian or you're going to wake up in torment but he held you in his hands I remember my grandmother uh, told us to pray that uh, uh, I, man I'm trying to, think, trying to think of it about God taking care of us uh, during the night uh, while we were sleeping she had a prayer for that I, it popped in my head and it just kind of went out I wish I could remember it for you but he held your hand he gave you life he made it possible for you to breathe while you were asleep Again, God is taking care of you. Every breath says God is faithful to you. No matter what you're doing. No matter if you're walking away from the night, he's, he's going to be faithful to you. He holds our salvation. He's faithful. We fail him many times, but he's still faithful. If you think you, can, you are somebody great, um, climb down from your ladder. You're not. Just get down from him. Look at the Son of God who is faithful to you every day. It is a faithful word, it says in that thing. He is faithful and true and in righteousness doth, doth, doth judge and make war. He's coming back. Now, we always want to say, well, Jesus loves him. Yes, he does. But this time when he comes back, he's coming back at judge and he's making war. You just read Zechariah. He's making war against all the unbelievers, all the evil of this world. He's ready to end it. He's going to stop it. He's coming back, and he's making war against them. He's not coming back as a peacemaker. Salvation's over with. He's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. He's going to make war, and he's going to fight that battle that it says back in there and get rid of all this sin, you see. In that verse, in verse, verse 11, uh, if we be dead with him, which we are, when we believe in him, we went back to the cross. In, in baptism, you just think about it. When you're baptized, what is, we, we do we baptize him in the, in, the, like a, in, the, in the likeness of his death, and we're raised in the likeness 
his resurrection, to walk in, new, in a newness of life. So we go all the way back. He paid it for it. We live with him, uh, uh, the resurrection life, to a new life. We have that. We, we, we see that. And like I say, in that baptism in, in Romans 6, 5, and 8, and 2 Corinthians 4, 10, uh, we see all of that. This is a faithful word he is talking about. In verse 12, his eyes, we're going to start getting the description. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. <clears throat> we see that he's, he's, he's coming. Uh, he, he is faithful to us. Revelation 19 is coming back, ride of the white horse. God is all present, so we know that this is Jesus riding the white horse and his humanity uh, that he is. Christ is, is man and God, and he's going to be riding on the horse, sitting down at the right hand of the Father. He gets up, and he gets on this horse, and he comes down. And Christ um, is coming back, and he's coming back to make war. Like I said, with a flame of fire. He's coming back as a judge. That's what partially what he's going to look look like. Uh, he, he's he's going to he's not he's not coming back as, as one that's going to be kind and loving, except to the believers. Um and he's going to start his king. So we see that he said he's promised that he is going to come. His name is written. It is, it is his personality of who he is. And don't think that he's coming back as, as being a kind. And just going to love everybody and let everybody into heaven. Don't bet your life on that. It is not going to happen. So his name is written. It shows his personality. Christ is faithful and true. To all believers, but unbelievers, like I say, he's going to judge. He's going to make make war. For us, we will never be judged as the church, as believers, for for our sin, because he died for them. But unbelievers, he will judge and make war with them. In that verse twelve, he's going to come with a flame of fire. Uh, written on there, he's doing it. verse thirteen, and he was clothed with a white vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. The Logos of God, in other words. The blood. The blood is from the Battle of Armageddon. Now, we come back with him. We're part of the army. But we're behind him. He is a good shepherd. The shepherd always leads. The shepherd doesn't go behind. And he's going to fight with us. He's going to fight for us. And that's why the blood is on that vesture there. The blood is for all of oh, that battle of Armageddon. The word of God. The word of God. The logos of God. That's that's what that word means. In 1 Corinthians uh, 118. If I can get there fast enough. I, mean, I got it in here somewhere. For the preaching or the logos of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. <clears throat> the Logos, that's what it means. It's talking about the Logos, the one who was sent to the cross, the Logos of God, the Word of God. God, the expression of the one we will see. We're going to see Christ in heaven. Christ. Um, he's not going to turn it up that, and then we go back to uh, chapter 19 and 12 through 14. Let's read, let's read verse 14 now. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses, clothed in fine linen and white and clean. Like I said, we're coming back with him. We are part of the armies, coming back with him. Even though he's going to be fighting for us, we are part of the armies there. Christ does all the following. We just follow. We just follow along. We have resurrected bodies. The old sin nature is taken away from us. It's gone when, when the rapture comes and we go to heaven. That old sin nature is taken away. So you don't have to worry about doing things like Satan did up there, or Lucifer, if you want to call him that, when he decided he was going to be better than God. We won't have it because the old, that old sin nature is taken away. All human good is taken away. But we, but we do no fighting. Christ does it all. Because when you read later on, it comes with the sword of his mouth. This means on the cross, Christ did it all. We don't do anything. Salvation is free. We don't do anything. It's a gift that we just have to accept. We have to accept this gift. We, we, 
We accept all the work that Christ did on the cross, and we are saved. And he does all the fighting for us, and he keeps us. That's what he's talking about. Um, all of that. And look what else is going to happen there that you see in verse 15. And out of the mouth goeth a sharp sword, as I said, that with it he should smite the nations. There's still going to be nations around. Now, whether the United States is there, I don't know. We're going to be part of maybe the Western Alliance or whatever. When you talk about the Western Alliance, the Southern, the Northern, and Eastern Alliances will probably be there. But there are going to be nations there. When God comes, he's about nations. So all nations are going to be, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. So, all nations are going to be here at the end of time. The rod of iron, he will rule with perfect justice. Okay? We don't get perfect justice now. Even our court system today, we don't even know. I mean, what, what can I say? We got people in jail that shouldn't even be there uh, for minor offenses, and we're letting other people out for other minor offenses. We, we have a system that, that is, is a two-tier system. Us, the middle class and poor, we get judged right away. The other ones get away with a lot. And, and you may believe it or not, just look at what's going on today in our society and our j judicial system and how it's doing things. It's, it's, it's not right, but when Jesus comes, it's going to be right. And even when we try to be right, sometimes we're wrong. We get the facts wrong, and people have been jailed in our society that shouldn't have been jailed. But that's because we're human and we're not perfect. But God is perfect, and when he comes down, he's going to be the judge, and he's going to rule, and it's going to be perfect judgment that we aren't getting now. <clears throat> See, and that sharp sword cometh out of his mouth. Jesus just is going to have to speak. You see. And it penetrates everything. And that sharp sword uh, will smite the nations. You get it? He speaks. And when people see him, they're going to know. Remember Zechariah, they look upon whom they are pierced and they cry. And they realize what's happened. When people see Jesus, they're going to realize they blew it. And they should have believed. But then it's too late. If you're waiting to get saved, waiting until you get, it may be too late. For those, it's going to be too late. Verse 16. And he hath, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, his robe. It goes back to Daniel, also chapter 2, verse 47. The banner written, he will wear, um, written will last forever. The forever name of Jesus, King of Kings, talking about his humanity, Christ's humanity. Lord of Lords, talking about his deity. Christ will be God-man forever and ever. The Logos of God, the Word of God. All of that, that's what he's going to carry forever. That's what we're going to see in heaven. And later we see that he sees the marks. John saw the marks of the cross on him. He will bear that, and all I remember. 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowl that, that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. This is, folks, the, the, the unbelievers only. This is the great supper of God. God's wrath. And the birds to come and to eat the flesh of these all these that have been killed. This is not for believers. This is for unbelievers only. This is when God is going to judge them. And the last one for this evening in verse 18. That ye may eat the flesh of the kings. <laughs> There's no discrimination here, folks. None whatsoever. <clears throat> He's going to eat kings and the flesh of, of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and, and the flesh of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. There's no discrimination here. The unbelievers are going to be judged, and they're going to see the wrath of God. And God is going to pour it out on them. All unbelievers will go to the supper of the great God, and then be cast in, into torment. This is what sometimes is referred to the, in the Bible as the baptism of fire. You know the sad thing about this is, too? It's when the white throne judgment comes. They're all going to come up out of there. And when God judges him, he's finally going to put him in the permanent hell, the lake of fire, the book of Revelation talks about, in the white throne judgment. Think about that. They're now going to go to torment. They're going to realize that they, they, 
they didn't believe in Christ, and then they're going to stand before God a second time. And they're going to taste a second death. We as believers don't taste a second death because we spend eternity with Jesus and eternal life. They're going to be in eternal torment with the devil and his angels. So what supper are we, you going to be at? Are you going to be at the Lamb Supper that we talked about before? When we're celebrating and having fun and enjoyment for almost a thousand years, are we going to be at that? Are you going to be at that supper because you accepted Christ as your personal Savior? You asked Him to forgive you of your sin and come into your life. Are you going to be at that supper? Or are you going to be at the, the supper of the great God? Which one are you going to be at today? If you don't know, you can find out for sure. All you have to do is realize that you are separated from God. You are an enemy with God. That your sin, and that, that's all sin is, is disobeying God and not keep not uh, being with Him. And then believing that Jesus came, born on this earth, took on human form, became God-man, went to the cross of Calvary as the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb to take away it's the sin of the world, to shed His blood. For since He's without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. He died. Shed His blood and died for your sin. The penalty of sin is death in Romans 6.23. That's what He did. And He rose on the third day. Do you believe that? Then you got to confess that. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. And then you can become saved. I didn't get the passage tonight, but John, Jesus says, if you come to me, I will not cast you out. If you come to Jesus with a true heart, really wanting for his forgiveness of sin, come to him with that. He won't cast you out. And you can have eternal life. And you won't have to go to the great, the supper of the great God that all unbelievers are going to. You can go to the Lamb's Supper in heaven with all the enjoyment and peace and tranquility. But it's up to you. You have to make that choice. I can't for you. Let me pray. Father, again, we just thank you for this time that you've given us. And Lord, for these passages. And Father, just uh, I just pray that you just use them as we complete, Father, this study out here as I put it out here, Father. I just pray the people that do hear it, Father, that you would use it, Father, just to convict them or maybe ask for a rededication of their life like it's happened th this weekend and father we just thank you thank you for your love thank you for your sacrifice on the cross of calvary for us and for these things we pray in jesus name amen